remember when we first met John McClane Argyle picked him up from the plane And took him down to Nakatomi Tower At the Christmas party And the terrorists were overzealous But it was sweet when they killed Alice And with a little help from Alan John McClane kicked out Welcome back to Shaft Movies, the podcast where we answer the question Were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, then this is the podcast for you. I am one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me are my co-host, Ash Apollonia Schlafly. Hi, y'all. And Big D Dickie Bird. Good evening. And each week, we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. The movies we cover are chosen by you, the listeners, who generously commission the films you love. If you'd like to see all the movies we have covered, will cover, or want to choose one for yourself, please visit shatthemovies.com and have a look. At the end of each podcast, we'll provide you, the audience, with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. That's how we help the podcast grow. Additionally, you can subscribe to our sister podcast, Shat on TV. We review TV series such as Westworld, Taboo, Lovecraft Country, American Gods, Game of Thrones, True Detective, and Watchmen. Find all the information and past episodes at ShadowOnTV.com. And finally, if you'd like to hang out with us live all week long, please follow and subscribe to our Twitch channel, ShatTheMovies.com slash Twitch, where we play video games and host watch parties all week long. All that being said, Big D, what movie are we reviewing today? So, Gene, uh, I think it was about two weeks ago, we released our first bonus episode. With American Gods being done, we finally have a little extra time where we can put out maybe an extra episode every few weeks. So we will do it on the occasion where a movie is specially warranted. So Mortal Kombat tied with the new release of the 2021. Uh, So we had another one of our listeners who wrote in. So he wanted to commemorate, sadly, the loss of one of America's truly unique artists, So Jared P. commissioned the 1984 American rock music drama film, Purple Rain. Well, and Jared wrote in and said, I'm a huge fan. I started listening to this brilliant pod in year one, possibly doing your first 10 to 15 movies. T2 should have never left the top five. From there, I've listened to every cast you guys have released. I've gone through every movie multiple times. I've listened to every show the crew has reviewed and interacted with Gene and Big D a few times. I'm a Hammers fan from Kalamazoo. I'm hoping Gene can recognize that. Boo the Gunners. Come on, you irons. I wish I would have realized how far in advance you guys are booked because I was hoping to commission Purple Rain in April for the five-year anniversary of Prince's death because he's one of my absolute favorites and I know he's also one of Gene's favorites. Plus, the ridiculous movie would be an amazing thing to hear you all tear apart. I gladly spend the money to squeeze it in, but I understand if you guys have a crazy schedule. If you can't squeeze it in this year, I might as well lock it in for the six-year anniversary. Fucking love the pod. Sending all my love from Michigan. Be well, Shaq crew. Jared P. Jared, I feel like you and I are destined to be friends, uh, both being EPL fans, and I'm a huge fan of K-Zoo. I've spent many hours wrenching at Quarter Kick, uh, getting breakfast at Poor Richard's, uh, and getting super fucking drunk at the Beer Exchange. So we've got to share a pint sometime particularly today after Arsenal got their asses handed to them this weekend uh, by Liverpool and West Ham is doing particularly well. Uh, Your comments wound me, sir. I am wounded. (laughs) And I encourage you, if you're feeling extra generous, to someday commission Green Street Hooligans, even though it's not from the 90s. I'll do it solo if I have to. (laughs) Well, Purple Rain is a 1984 rock musical scored by and starring Prince in his acting debut. Developed to showcase his talents, it contains several concert sequences featuring Prince and his band, The Revolution. The film is directed by Albert Magnoli, who later became Prince's manager from a screenplay written by Magnoli and William Benn. Principal photography took place almost entirely in Minneapolis. The film features many local landmarks, including the Crystal Court of the IDS Center and the legendary First Avenue Nightclub, which was paid $100,000 for the club being used during filming. It stayed closed for 25 days. Purple Rain grossed over $72 million worldwide against its $7.2 million budget. The film won an Oscar for Best Original Song Score and in 2019 was added by the Library of Congress for preservation in the National Film Registry for being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. 
Publications and critics have regarded Purple Rain as one of the greatest musical films of all time. Purple Rain was supported with its soundtrack album of the same name, which featured two U.S. chart-topping singles, When Doves Cry and Let's Go Crazy, as well as the number two hit, Purple Rain. The soundtrack is certified 13 times platinum by the Recording Industry Association of America and has sold over 25 million copies worldwide. Ash, Big D, I have many fond memories of Purple Rain. Let's start with you, though, Big D. Tell me what you know about it. The only thing I can remember is buying the Purple Rain soundtrack on cassette. I do not remember the movie at all, but I remember on the radio, Let's Go Crazy, Doves Cry. I probably only listened to those three songs. So other than that, I would not say I was a big Prince fan. And only recently did I truly gain a respect for him as an artist. But until this week, I never sat down and watched the entire movie. Uh, And coming up on this sad anniversary of his death, uh, I think it was poignant and it made me really, really think about how much we lost. I can't even begin to think about when my obsession with Prince began. I mean, it feels like my entire life, Prince has been something that... I was obsessed with and knew all about. I mean, I've adored him for as long as I can remember. And I do have a distinct memory of seeing the poster for this movie or maybe just like the cover of the VHS for the first time. And I just remember being so taken aback by like the font, which is like so 80s. And he's wearing that great like peasant blouse and that purple jacket. And I just like immediately became so much cooler. I feel like the second I looked at the poster and then even cooler after I listened to the soundtrack and watched the movie, because for me, Prince has always been about fashion. He's been about music and he's been about sexuality. And this movie has all of that in droves. And so I cannot tell you how excited I am to visit this one for chat. This a lot of times I kind of go, ugh, because I don't really know if it's going to hold up. But I saw this for the last time like a month ago. So I knew it was going to be a good time revisiting it for chat. So my best friend of many, many years, uh, Victoria, we lost contact a few years back because I, being a shitty friend, uh, skipped her 40th birthday party in Chicago and instead went to a video game tournament. That is what a good friend I am. So she stopped talking to me. I stopped talking to her. But watching this movie, this movie's commission caused me to write her a letter. Uh, thanking her and hoping to reconnect. But she started my love affair with Prince and changed my life completely by introducing me to his music beyond the typical 80s hits. So I think a lot of people, when they think of Prince, think of like the pants with no ass on them, or they think about the the big hits, right? Little Red Corvette, you know, I Want to Be Your Lover. Raspberry Beret. Raspberry Beret. And there's so much more to Prince. It's such Mm -hmm. a deep, deep catalog of hundreds of songs. And this guy is an absolute anomaly. He's an incredible artist. And I think the most confident man who ever graced the earth. And Victoria and I spent so many nights, you know, going to 3121, which was the Chicago uh, monthly Prince party where they played only Prince and Prince inspired stuff. People all dressed up like Prince and Prince related artists. Then we would go home and to her apartment and spend these late nights and hungover mornings under blankets on our sofa watching Purple Rain. This is a miracle movie and it has great personal (laughs) significance. So, Mm -hmm. Jared, thank you so much for commissioning it. I'm so excited to do this. Okay, I can swallow all this up until this point. Listen, I like Prince, great musician, but we have to separate two things clearly right now. Prince the artist And Purple Rain the movie, okay? I disagree. We can spend wonderful nights cuddling under blankets, watching Purple Rain. That's very different than Prince the Artist. Prince is Purple Rain. Like, it's it's impossible to separate the two i mean i tom had never seen this before which i don't know how that's happened and he was like oh he's like so it's a concert video you know it's a concert movie and i was like no 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 but kind of you know i mean it's it is prince there's no way to separate the two yeah this is prince's horcrux Yes. Oh, my God, Gene, you just blew my mind. So if if we're going to believe this is a representation of Prince as a person and as a musician, the entire movie, not just the positive. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It's a distillation of his essence in cinematic form. God, it's his horcrux. So Prince might might decide to slap a person, right? Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. As long as we start with that, that's a good place for us to begin. That's why I'm going to roll this trailer. The Kid is a talented but troubled frontman of his Minneapolis-based band, The Revolution. To escape his difficult home life, he spends his days rehearsing and his nights performing at the First Avenue nightclub. Another artist, Morris Day, is aware that The Revolution's guitarist, Wendy, and keyboardist, Lisa, are frustrated that The Kid is unwilling to play their compositions. He lobbies the club's owner to replace The Revolution with a girl group, which Morris is already forming. He targets the kid's girlfriend, Apollonia, to lead his group and tries to persuade her that the kid won't help her because he's too focused on himself. Apollonia eventually joins Morris's group, which he names Apollonia Six. When she reveals her newfound partnership to the kid, he becomes furious and slaps her as his father had struck him earlier. So this movie opens up, and if you haven't seen it before, it opens up with this amazing musical performance to kind of set the scene for what this movie is going to be. And I know we're supposed to be reviewing Purple Rain, but as we're sitting here a year into the pandemic, you have to understand, I grew up in New Orleans, and so live music is like a food group for me, right? Like it is something that if I don't do, I I feel like I'm not human. I feel like I'm not living my my best life. And y'all, this opening made me miss live music so much. You've got those chords kicking up. You've got the energy on the stage that bleeds over into the room when he starts, even just that simple, like, dearly beloved. And then it's like, oh, like, you know, and you feel yourself getting like so excited in that moment. And I wanted to be in the 80s with that fantastic Bowie makeup and those outfits and in the crowd. And I just want to be back in person and experience these things again. And with Prince specifically, you guys, nobody could compete with him when he was alive in terms of stage presence. That's personally what I believe. The man could command a fucking stage. But I know he's been gone for five years and I don't know if anybody can compete with him now, even with him being gone, this being his Horcrux seriously blown my mind with that gene. Like this being kind of like the, the talisman to like bring a piece of him back into our lives. It's just beautiful. And I'll just say this, cause I know we can't do every single song, his performance of the beautiful ones in this movie, especially when he gets down on his knees and just, he's so He's almost ethereal with the way that he sings and the way that he moves. I mean, how could you not follow over him? I said, we reviewed Dirty Work recently. And I said, how could anybody ever love Norm MacDonald? Well, this five foot three little man, you could not, if you're a man, if you're a woman, if you're non-binary, you have to fall all over him because he oozes sex. He oozes power. And I want everything there is to do with him and his music. Do you need a moment to compose yourself? I've never seen you this, this... You okay? Take a breath. I I feel good. Yeah. Okay. Just just checking where you are. Okay. I just want to make sure. Because listen, I respect Prince, but growing up, I always thought it was a shtick. I always thought it was a hey, look at me. I'm gonna be kind of out there. I'm gonna be wild. I'm bizarre. You know. Ooh, I'm gonna change my name to an unpronounceable symbol. Ooh, look at all. My... And then somewhere, I think it was probably early 2000s, the Chappelle Show. With Charlie Murphy comes out and he tells the story about them being in a club in the 80s. Him and his brother, Eddie, they're at a club. Prince invites him to a party. They're there with a bunch of women. And he says, let's play basketball. He comes out there in his blouse, in his high heels, and apparently kicked the shit out of them in pickup basketball. Then said, let's have pancakes. And then it hit me. I said, maybe this whole thing wasn't just a bizarre ruse. He actually lived it. And that was when I kind of started to have a little more respect for him and started to investigate him as an artist. Yeah, it's like when I found out that he was from Minneapolis. It's like, what the fuck? Like, I thought that this guy (laughs) had to be from, like, London, Paris, New York, L.A., something like that. No, Minneapolis, Minnesota. This guy's entire story is so American. He's this epileptic, androgynous little man from Minneapolis who you can't really place him as far as his race or his sex or even his musical style. Like, how do you define it? Is it R&B? Is it rock? 
what what is he playing there? It's all undefined, which is why I think it is so hard for the mainstream to comprehend Prince. I think that we have a tendency to want to be able to put a label on things and understand what some somebody is or what it is that they're doing. And with Prince, his entire career, it was impossible. Well, I don't think it's the fact that he's from Minneapolis that's amazing. It's the fact that he stayed there. Usually people want to get out of Minneapolis. You know, you become a big star. That's not exactly the hub of the music industry. You're going to go out to L.A. But if we're going to mix this movie with Prince himself, I think Prince had to have been as as much of a musical genius as he's got to be a fucking asshole. Because I'm watching this entire thing, and I keep having Roger (laughs) in the back of my head talking about the game, that book. It's the, the pickup artist Bible. And I'm like, Prince is the pickup artist. Everything he is doing is a tactic directly out of the book. Peacocking and negging. Those are the two big ones. And for people out there who haven't heard Roger preach the Bible of the pickup artist, okay, peacocking is when you wear something ridiculous to stand out. Big puffy hat, welding goggles, a whole fucking bunch of jewelry, maybe a a ruffle high collar shirt or a purple trench coat. It doesn't have to make you feel good. It just has to get attention, okay? Prince does that to the T with the way he dresses. Then there's negging. So negging is basically where you tell a girl... You give her insults to knock her down, her self-esteem, so that that way she feels like she wants to win your approval. That's all Prince does. He takes the bracelet off of her. Oh, now it's mine. He threatens to leave her on the bike. He actually drives off. He keeps pulling away from her. And then he says, no, I'm not going to help you. You know why? Because you wouldn't even pass the initiation. She then gets naked. So he's fucking with her head. And then he says, hey, don't even sit on my seat. I want you to get it wet. Of course, double entendre, because he knows he's gotten her so excited. But Prince is a bit of a toxic asshole. But this is the difference. He's Prince. Oh, come on. (laughs) So, like, if any other guy's doing that, I'm like, yeah, that's peacocking and nagging. But with Prince, it's like he's earned that. And this is something I've always said as far as pickups go. Beyond all the nagging and the peacocking, whatever tactics you use, here's the best way to get in people's pants be a fucking badass, Mm -hmm. right? Be amazing at the things you do and good things will come to you. I've always believed this in my life. It's like, look, work your ass off the things that you could be good at, whether it's physically, whether it's mentally, whatever it is that you can develop in yourself, that is the best way to get laid. So, you know, there's that scene where he walks up behind Apollonia for the first time and he's just staring at her and she knows that he's behind her. He's got those great fucking glasses on and he's just looking at her. Any other dude, that would be so creepy. But with him, it's like a huge turn on. Like, it's like she feels like special because he's doing it and you want him to keep doing it and you want him to stare at you from behind. And then y'all, she, he turns around and he's fucking gone. Like what a slick move. He's not a pickup artist. He's a, he's a slick motherfucker. Yeah. And you can feel his intensity when they first meet, like he's staring at her, she's staring at him. And then what does he do? He like stares at her information on that card that she left for the manager. And then she's staring at him again. Then he disappears. Then he reappears. Then he disappears again. This was like a running gag on SNL. Prince being able to just poof in the thin air. <laughs> but in a world where you could be anything you want, when it's your movie, why not choose to be magic? Prince knows he's not good with words. Like when he's talking to her at the lake, it's clumsy. He works with music and with his body and he's playing off of those things. And I like to think that this is really how romance works in Prince's head. It's all fun and games. It's all trickery. It's all head games. I got to ask the question, though, although it looks like abuse, although it looks like negging or peacocking or whatever else, would you rather have this or would you have some guy that trades text messages with you on Hinge and then you go to Applebee's? No, I I would want Prince to take me down to the fucking edge of Lake Minnetonka and baptize me. Yeah, he's like he he looks like a sexual animal. He I would pay money to watch him. It would be forget if you're a guy, girl, whatever. He just he's like a snake. Yes, a sexy snake. And speaking of sexy snakes, let's talk about that sex scene. Oh. Because I did not know this, but in doing my research for the pod, they shot three versions of this sex scene with three different ratings in mind. So they shot a PG-13 version, an R version, and an NC-17 version. The way you're sounding for the podcast, your research, did you watch all three versions about four times? So I tried to find them, but I couldn't. Um, otherwise, the answer would have been many. But <laughs> I, I couldn't find them. But the the cut that made the movie, that made the final film, was the R-rated version. And first of all, 
I'm really curious how Prince would do a PG-13 sex scene because that sounds awful. But puppet. I also wonder what did the X-rated version look like? Because I don't know about you guys, but this was pretty sanitized, right? It wasn't really a sexy sex scene. Uh, so what I expected was he was going to pull the old Al Pacino <laughs> and every woman was going to be ah, laying on the bed, just, just writhing with pleasure. He does something that surprised me. We never see him actually engage in sex, but the lead up to it, I was like, oh my, oh, what is this? <laughs> yes. But I'm going to put all the listeners in the position. Uh, Apollonia is on her knees. She's on the bed. She's wearing some kind of shortcut top and red lace panties. And Prince is behind her. And he, at first I thought he was going to bend her over, but he doesn't. He just starts putting his hands around her like a snake. I'm talking Snakes flicking. Don't have hands. What? He's a snake with hands, and he is like he is just flipping the bean. He is he is literally playing with her and stimulating her. He takes the tip of one of his finger and slips it under the panties. I'm watching this, being like, how did did the editor miss this? How did the actual film review miss this? You think she's acting with pleasure? That finger is doing the work. This was real. But Apollonia is in danger. Does no one else see this? It didn't look dangerous to me. No, no. She waited in a dark alley for a dude who then takes her on his motorcycle with no helmet and probably speeding, I might add, to his house. And he's like, let's watch in the window. Look at my parents who are fucked up on the couch. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then come on. Let's go into the basement. Oh, look. It's full of dolls. I'm going to hide. He, he, he. Then he pops up behind her. And what does he do? He plays her recordings of a woman crying in reverse. (laughs) Uh, Forget about the fact that he leaves 100 candles burning all day so that when they come in, it's a dramatic entrance. But the women crying in reverse are beautiful, Gene. He makes that very clear because it sounds like she's laughing. Listen, you've got a clear alternative here to this guy, which is like the sun to Prince's moon, which is Morris Day, right? (laughs) And I'm like, this is a hard choice to make because Purple Rain wouldn't be Purple Rain without Morris Day. Like, he is the perfect rival for Prince. And in my opinion, one of the best villains of all time. He's controlled where Prince is wild. He's strategic and planning where Prince is impulsive. And he's a fine dancer in his own right. I got to say, honestly, while watching this movie, I get just as excited to see Jungle Love and The Bird than I do Prince's performances. Totally different. It's pop schlock. There's no artistry to it. It's just goofy shit. But Morris Day, that's what he is. He's hilarious talking about his brass water bed and his Italian chef whose name he can't remember and calling Apollonia the finest motherfucker I've seen in ages. And of course, the best part of Morris Day is his sidekick, Jerome. And if you guys haven't seen Purple Rain and you're you're discounting it because you think it's just an homage to Prince and it's just going to be Prince playing his guitar for two hours, watch it for Morris Day and Jerome because Jerome – This man will throw a woman in a dumpster for you and carry your (laughs) mirror so you can look at yourself anytime you want. He's a great friend. I, again, in doing my research, found out that Morris Day didn't even get invited to the premiere. He couldn't even get a ticket. And so he had to have somebody else that was in the movie get a ticket for him. That's so messed up because I totally agree with you. I think that, you know, obviously this is a Prince film, but the actual acting Like, if you look at, like, the time on screen, I mean, Morris Day is the acting star of this film, and he's incredible. He's so funny. And you also got to realize, this movie is made to make Prince look in the best light, that he is the kid, he's the chosen one. And I think Morris Day, it was risky for him to take this role, because he could have come out and actually hurt his career. Big D, I don't know if I agree with that, though, because I think they showed the vulnerability and the shitty day lives of all these people, including Morris Day. One of the most incredible aspects of nightclub culture is when you are at the club that night, you can be anything you want to be regardless of your day life. So we see Prince and at home, the kid, he's got a, he's got a family that's fighting. He lives in the basement. Morris Day, I mean, the first time we see him, he's like cleaning his house and like looking through his suits. And he's got that janky car that Jerome drives him around in that like the windows don't even go down right. But you could work the counter at Taco Bell and still be queen of the scene at the nightclub. And we see this in movies like Quadrophenia, where Ace Face uh, is just a bellboy in real life. And this was very real when I lived in Chicago. Like the hottest dudes at 3121, which was the the Prince Night there at Berlin, they were uh, living in like cramped apartments and they were barely scraping by. But on Prince Night, 
on that one night a month, they made sure that their hair was right and their outfits were perfect. And yeah, afterward, they needed to depend on me for money to get their cab fare home or maybe buy them a hot dog after because they had no money. But they were there for the spirit of the night. Yeah. And I think that's one of the biggest like revolutionary things about this is you've got this guy who has charisma oozing out of all his pores. And then in the daylight, he looks like a normal dude that like is struggling to get by. And as far as it's meant to make him look in the best light, there's so much about this that is autobiographical that makes him look like a raging asshole, which we'll get into later, like the shit with the revolution and parts of the band, like all of that was autobiographical. And I think that it's really important. And even some of the lines like with his dad directly came from conversations he had with his dad in real life. And I don't know. I I think that Prince looks like probably what exactly he was, a god on stage and kind of a dick off of it. At the club, the kid responds to the internal band strife, the pressure to draw more crowds, and his strained private life by performing the uncomfortably personal Darling Nikki. His performance publicly humiliates Apollonia, who runs off in tears and angers both Morris Day and Billy Sparks, the bar manager, worsening his situation. Billy confronts the kid, castigating him for bringing his personal life onto stage and warning him that he's wasting his musical talent as his father did. Apollonia 6 successfully debuts and Billy warns the kid that his first avenue slot is at risk. I'm the type of Prince fan that likes the big hits. I like the rah-rah, let's go crazy. I like those upbeat songs. I'm not so much a fan of the, "Ah, yeah, ah," like that for five minutes. It's really good. The beginning of Cream bothers me, that whole moan. I'm like, let's get to the song, okay? But I felt like the line in the movie where Billy, the manager, says to him, he says, what the fuck's wrong with you, kid? No one digs your music but yourself. Look around you. No one's digging you. Oh, buddy, what a fucking waste. Big D, Billy Sparks is black. It's That's that's Mickey. from, <laughs> And it's also not set in the 1920s. I'll tell you. I'll tell you, kid. What you got to do is you're fucking wasting your time like your father, kid. Yeah, I guess okay? And I feel most of his music is like that. It's self-indulgent. It's supposed to push forward that narrative that he is just an orgasm machine okay what (laughs) which of his songs in this are self-indulgent name one song don't don't think about his catalog think just about because you want to keep it about purple rain so which in purple rain is a self-indulgent song thank you for clarifying because i would have gone with emancipation the three disc uh, set that he came out with with the joan osborne cover one of us that's fucking bad but in this movie I don't know the name of the song. It's the one where he comes out on stage and uh, it, it, he ends up on top of the, the speaker. Darling Nikki. Ah! Ah! Okay. Yeah. Darling Nikki. Yeah. We just reviewed Dirty Work. This is how you fucking do revenge. Fuck you, Norm MacDonald. It is with a song like Darling Nikki. It was a revolution of a song. It is the reason why Tipper Gore got her panties all wet and it made her nervous and wanted to go out and do some stickers for, you know, parental advisories later on because she heard the song and it made her so uncomfortable. It is a great fucking song. There's nothing self-indulgent about that song at all. Maybe it's just him rolling around on stage and it's just... So he makes you feel things. No, it's more noise. That make you uncomfortable. It's, it's like animal noises it's like come on right sing. and they make you feel uncomfortable down in your pants no, they don't i wouldn't have a problem no I, i'm not threatened by prince i'd love to watch him in action i think it'd be great i might want to join who knows but i'm just saying I, when i go to a concert i want to see music i don't want to see animal sounds people rolling around the floor or playing shit backwards i mean unless you're doing a shit ton of acid you're not going to see music buddy you hear the music you see the performance <laughs> that's what i meant <laughs> <laughs> Listen, the dude wrote more than 500 songs. Like, they're not all going to be gems. I agree with you. Some of the later stuff, especially when he went Jehovah's Witness, not great. But everything in this movie is fantastic. What I don't understand is this whole setup for one of the bands getting cut. So Billy Sparks, the club owner, you know, he goes to Prince and he's like, hey, what's with the fucking music? Hey, what's with the fucking music? <laughs> and the kid says, well, it's about life. You know, he's like, life my ass, motherfucker. Like, whoa, yes. one of you four bands has got to go. That's what he's saying. I need three bands. There's four of you. Mm-hmm. So the four bands are Morris Day in the Time, The Revolution, Apollonia 6, and I'm guessing the fourth band is like that guy who was just out there singing Modern Air for like 15 straight minutes yeah. while <laughs> dramatic shit is going on backstage. Why don't they just cut Modern Air? That band sucked. 
you got to cut the revolution. And they're not reliable. Billy's running a business. He comes out for one song and then pop smoke and he's gone. You can't do that. People paid a ticket. Why do you think the crowd's thinning out? Because they don't know how many songs he's going to do. He could do one or two. Yeah, but Apollonia 6 is like a fucking unknown commodity. Modern era is known to suck in Morris Day as a god. So, I mean, it becomes easy. Oh, well, Apollonia 6 is a future guaranteed to suck. People don't know it yet because they're so new. That song, Sex Shooter, that <laughs> might be the worst song. Of- this performance in The Touch, The Club, I, I wanted to see the Pussycat Dolls. I was like, please, I want to turn this <laughs> off. They're wearing lingerie, and they're singing this song. And I'm going to read you the lyrics, okay? I need you to pull my trigger, baby. I can't do it alone. I need you to be my main thing. Plaything, pillar of stone. Oh, who? I'm a sex shooter. Shooting love in your direction. Oh, who? Is it a ooh who? <laughs> <laughs> it's different when you read it. It's different when you read it. Oh, who? <laughs> yeah, it's a Socratic method. That's why it was a shitty yeah. song. <laughs> I completely agree with both of you. I think the most unbelievable thing in this movie is one that Apollonia 6 would ever be successful and B that anybody would prefer this over the revolution. I don't think anybody would ever say that throughout this movie. She shows up in town and like Morris day and Prince are fighting over her, but for like three quarters of the movie, you don't hear her sing. So when she finally comes up on stage with Apollonia six, you're expecting big things. Talk about a fucking letdown. Like she's not good. I thought it was Sheena Easton at first. I was like, I think this is the girl who was in Prince's band, but she this, she wasn't, right? I think every woman in the world at some point was in Prince's band because he had like Sheila E, he had Sheena Easton, he had Wendy. Well, and originally the part of Apollonia was supposed to go to the girlfriend that Prince had at the time when they were starting to film, which was, was Vanity. And Vanity decided instead of doing Purple Rain that she was going to try for the Scorsese film. She actually did The Last Temptation of Christ and... Eventually, her um, scenes got cut from that movie, so didn't work out for her. Um, and then they asked Jennifer Beale, who was the star of Flashdance, and she turned it down. Uh, Gina Gershon really wanted this role of Showgirls fame. She really wanted this role, but you know they didn't uh, give it to her, and instead it went to Apollonia. And I did forget the fact that she's really beautiful in a lot of ways. She's got that gorgeous hair, and she's got a beautiful body, mm-hmm. and real life though prince really put her through the ringer so she was dating david lee roth at the time and he made her break up because he didn't want her to be with anyone famous because he didn't want her to take away like their relationship outside of the movie to take away from the movie itself and then prince also made her eat whatever he was eating while they were filming Mm -hmm. um so weird but again it's prince I kind of get it. Okay, hold on. A couple things here. One is you know that she uses this as an excuse to break up with David Lee Roth. That's how it actually <laughs> went. She's like, Maybe. fuck, how do I get? He's like, hey, man, I'm at a moon. She's like, oh, fuck, I got it. He's like, jump. Uh, you know what? Prince told me I have to break up with you. I'm sorry. I got to go. But Apollonia, you said she was pretty. Sarah says she's pretty. Everyone says she's pretty. I think Apollonia looks like she's always smelling a fart. No. 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 She's pretty and she's curvy. You're on board with this? Uh, I, I like her. Like, I think when she's made up, she looks artificial. But when she's coming out of the lake, like with her hair wet, I think without the makeup, I think she looks good. Yeah, I think there was something else when she was coming out of oh, the lake. Oh, shut up. I'm talking attention. about when she's wearing the leather jacket. You like their boobies. That was nice, too. I appreciate that Prince went for a woman. I mean, a woman looking woman and a person of color, which was uncommon for films in 1984. But Ash... Getting back to what you were talking about, I mean, Prince, this is fucking weird. There's something going on here because Vanity quit Vanity 6. And so then they brought in Apollonia and made Apollonia 6. And Vanity, if you want to go back that far, she was Rick James's date to like a, a music awards thing. Prince sees her. He's like, I want you in my girl group because I've been dreaming about having a girl group ever since I was a kid and I saw a star is born. So then he started dating (laughs) Vanity, but before that, he was dating one of the other women in the band. And before it was Vanity 6, it was called The Hookers, and he wanted Vanity's name – again, this is according to rumor – that he wanted to call Vanity Vagina. Of course. Why not? Why wouldn't you? Yeah. You guys are Prince apologists. Anything he does is okay. I can't wait till we get to the slapping part. To hear Ashley justify it. I cannot wait. It's coming up. Continuing on my Apollonia criticism, though, I'm not a fan. 
like, I don't know if we're supposed to be rooting for her. I'm not supposed to really like her. She rips off a cabbie at the beginning of the movie. She walks into the nightclub. She knocks the drinks out of a server's hands. And then instead of apologizing and help clean it up, she demands to see the manager. Like she's like the OG Karen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, give me a job. I want to be performer. Yeah, her introduction was not was not that great. Um, but moving away from Apollonia, one of the big kind of underlying things that this movie tries to explore are the cycles of abuse that a lot of people find themselves stuck within. And I did think that the movie did an interesting job of showing how these abuse cycles kind of pass from generation to generation, because you've got the kid who his whole life, we can assume, has been watching his dad beat the shit out of his mom. And then with Apollonia, the second she disappoints him, his first instinct, even though he's seen how wrong this is and what it does to his mom, his first instinct is to hit her. It's not okay. I'm not an apologist for this, Big D. I don't think it's okay at all. But I think think it is indicative of how difficult those cycles are to break. And, you know, I thought about my dad because my dad had like a horrendous father. He was ironically a preacher and he beat the shit out of them. And he put my grandmother in the hospital multiple times. And my dad was the youngest of three boys and he put all of them in the hospital. And my dad just had a really shitty upbringing. And despite that, like my father has never hit me. He never hit my brother. My dad's this big teddy bear. And he says all the time that the thing he's most proud of in his life is breaking that generational abuse cycle because it's just so much easier to just emulate what you've seen. And it's the thing I respect the most about him. And I I think it was an interesting way to look at how this happens that not that he can't help it, but that it's instinctual. And like, he would have to work really hard to not repeat those patterns. So I got to admit when he slaps her, I was like, Oh, what? What just happened? I, I, it threw me back. I, I was not expecting it at all that he opened. He just slaps her. I know you're not justifying it, but you're saying, you know, we're exploring the cycles of abuse. And it, it's not because if it was, Prince would have taken the subject matter like seriously. Instead, we get a ridiculous Prince montage, a pensive montage that focuses on him. He's driving his bike around. He's alone. He's standing pensively on the dock looking at the sunset. He's thinking about making love in a haystack. He's giggling and playing with flowers in the grass. He's thinking then about one time his father slaps his mother. He slaps Apollonia. He then drives on a railroad track with Dove's Cry playing in the background. It was about him. It wasn't the fact, oh, man, I slapped her. I shouldn't have done that. The cycle of abuse. He's thinking about, oh, poor fucking me. You want to talk about the movie being about him. Apollonia tells Morris Day that she's going to hawk her anklet at a pawn shop and, a, and to buy a guitar. And I'm like, oh, cool. Like, she's going to try to further her music yeah. career. She's buying a guitar now. She's moving on. She's going to do her own thing. No, no. She hawked her anklet to buy a guitar for Prince. <laughs> First of all, dude has a guitar. Like, many of them, probably. He's Prince. Secondly, she doesn't have a fucking car. She'd probably have to take a cab with the guitar to get to his basement to go see him. And third, I just got to wonder, like, how good was this dick? Like, how good are you fucking people that they're taking a trip and, and selling their jewelry to buy you a guitar? Well, and can I just point out that When Doves Cry is a song that is about comparing a relationship the singer is having to the relationship that his parents have. And whenever demanding comes up, the father's on screen, like it's edited really smart and it matches the lyrics in a really smart way. That's what that entire song is about, is that the world is in such a shitty state that even doves are crying. And, you know, these symbols of hope and him feeling like he can't break up. That's what doves I, are. There no, are symbols I, I, of hope. I understand that. But- I mean, that's what the whole song is about. So cheesy, sure. I mean, montages are cheesy just inherently. But, I mean, there is a connection to the music there. I just wish the victim of the abuse had gotten more than a, a 0.27 second sliver of a slice in the montage. I remember thinking this was really sad when I was younger. But in my older years, when I watch it, I'm kind of like, you right, dude, slow down a little bit. Like, were you guys even dating? Were you exclusive? Were you going steady? Like, why are you so attached, Prince? Yeah, I think the movie kind of struggles in expressing the passage of time. Because until these flashbacks, I didn't even realize that they had all these moments together. I thought this whole movie was taking place over the course of like a week. 
this apparently was like weeks and weeks and weeks. They were developing like a whole relationship really? that we just missed. Yeah. No, Gene, I, I thought it was because of what you said. The dick is that good. I always used to say that crystal meth has got to be fantastic. It has got to be so good that you're willing to just shit your life away. You can know right in front of you, this is a wrong decision. I shouldn't steal from my kid's college fund, but you still do it. That's Prince's dick. Prince's dick is the crystal meth of sex. Well, I mean, you saw him flicking the bean oh my as God, you yeah, put it so aptly earlier. Like, clearly, you know, he's got a little bit of skull going on. He definitely does. Definitely does. Don't let it touch your lips. It's like crystal meth. You can't stop. One hit, you're done. Ash is looking at you like, I, I would, though. I know she would. She'd be out there with the pipe. She'd be like this. One more. One more hit. I'm good. One more bean. Okay. Time for rehab. <laughs> There's only one. But continue. <laughs> Look at her. I've <laughs> never seen you this giddy since I heard this. The parts of a flower are so constructed that very, very often the wind will cause pollination. That's the only two things that makes you that happy. Prince giving sexual pleasure or grease to. I just want to point out that uh, I am halfway through my Purple Rain cocktail, which I made for tonight, uh, which was uh, gin tequila, rum, vodka, and a creme de cassis with some energy drink mixed in it. I am full on sweating, you guys. Like, I am a wet mess. Yeah. You're like Prince on stage? I mean, I'm a little red-faced right now, you know? <laughs> You're a little flush. I'm a little flush. Well, the kid seizes Apollonia from a drunken Morris, and the two argue and fight. Apollonia then abandons him. Returning home, he finds the house in tatters with his mother nowhere to be found. When he turns on the basement light, his father, who had been lurking in the basement with a loaded handgun, shoots himself in the head. Frenzied after a night of torment, the kid tears apart the basement to release his frustration, only to find a large box of his father's musical compositions. The next morning, the kid picks up a cassette tape of one of Wendy and Lisa's compositions, a rhythm track named Slow Groove. And he begins to compose. So at this point, I was feeling a bit out of my element. I was completely lost. Then the dad shoots himself. I was like, okay, why does he have a bandage on his stomach? Where did he shoot him? Did the mother do it? Who's the hanging person over the stairs? Was that Prince's vision? I felt really, really lost. I felt like my dad trying to set a VCR timer. What are bearer bonds? <laughs> That's, I feel lost. And I was paying attention. I really was. I was. Uh, were you? Yes. Because he clearly shoots himself in the head. He's lying on the floor doing that little uh, thing, you know, because he's been shot in his head with a bandage on his head right. with the blood coming out. In the hospital, yes. But on the stretcher, he had a stomach. No, like, on the oh. floor of the basement. He's got the thingy on his head and it's bleeding. And I'm going to Google that. I think he shot himself in the stomach. So regardless of how much I'm lost in this movie, I think Prince is credible. He's credible at what he does, but anytime he tries to play the tough guy, it was laughable. When he comes in the room when his dad is abusing his mother and he kind of shuffles over with his heels on and kind of pushes him into the wall, it's comical. Or where he's standing there in the back of the room with his sunglasses on, or even when he pulls like the raging bull the going after Morris on his bike, it was not believable. Prince, great lover, just a sexual machine. But when he tries to play that badass, it is laughable. He should stick to the brooding musician. See, but I respect the fact that he did action the way Prince would do action. Like, they didn't use any camera tricks, like a close-up shot of, like, a punch to the face. And so, maybe look at some tough ass. Like, he's not really kicking ass. Prince was trained in ballet, and this is dance. Like, this is West Side Story fighting. This is a stage production of violence. I am so glad you said that, because in one scene, it looked like he was going to just... Yeah. You know, before, like, he likes with, like... You're a jet, you're a jet. <laughs> What's fascinating about this, though, is that with the dad shooting himself and all that, Prince originally wanted death all over this movie. Like, mm -hmm. they had to tone it back a ton. The dad's supposed to just kill himself and be done with it. You know, he was tempered by other people involved in the production of the movie, but he wanted, like, a body count in this movie. 
Well, and I know you said you didn't buy him being tough, but I, I do buy his acting in this. I think he did a, a really decent job. And the scene where his dad does shoot himself, it still was very powerful and very disturbing to me because it does kind of come out of nowhere. And I think that Prince plays it really well where he's sitting on the bed with the cops all around him and he's clearly incredibly upset. And again, I think this is super accurate because he dedicates you know, the song later to his dad. His mom is there in the hospital with his dad at the end of the movie. And you're going, what the fuck? Why? And again, I think that this is accurate. And I know I mentioned my dad. We're, we're going down Ashley's horrible family stories trail tonight. But my mom's dad was also super abusive. He was a horrible man. I was terrified of him growing up. And when he died, my grandmother, who despised him and my mother who despised him both threw themselves on his body and were just sobbing and i was 16 years old and i was so confused because they hated him and even to this day when my grandmother talks about my grandfather she talks about him in like some weird other reality where he wasn't what he actually was and i think that that aspect of abuse that need to protect your abusers in some way. That's the hardest part of abuse to break. And it's the part that's hardest for those of us on the outside to understand. And I appreciated that rawness that he still cared about his dad and his mom still cared about his dad instead of just being glad that he was, you know, shooting himself in the head and you know, hopefully dead. It's supposed to be dramatic, but it's also funny. Like, all this is funny in a fucked up way, right? Like, when, when his dad smacks his mom around and she's lying there, she's like, you never let me have any fun. That is not what I expected her to say. <laughs> like, lady, that is not your biggest problem. This man is beating yeah. you and you're worried about being able to have fun? Like, no. And it made me laugh. And it's inappropriate to laugh for sure. Like, it is not funny that a woman is being abused. But it is funny that Prince... And everybody involved in the production of this movie thought that that was the line to deliver exactly that moment. And it's okay for a movie to be enjoyable and entertaining in unintentional ways. And so for that, I think the movie deserves some applause. For sure. Well, at First Avenue, all is quiet in the Revolution's dressing room until the time stops by to taunt the kid about his family life. Once on stage, the kid announces that he will be playing, quote, a song the girls in the band wrote dedicated to his father revealed to be Purple Rain. As the emotional song ends, the kid rushes from the stage and out the back door of the club, intending to ride away on his motorcycle. However, before he can mount it, he realizes that his new song has thrilled the crowd. I'm trying to figure out what's going on here, because if you guys are saying this is semi-autobiographical, he is the last person you would want to be in a band with. He is toxic. He's aggressive. He's condescending. He's dismissive of anyone in the band. He's late for practice. He starts fights with everyone. He's egotistical. He uses the female members of the, of the band as sex props on stage. He's got the one girl in front of him on her knees pretending to blow him until he climaxes in her mouth, and then she kind of pushes her away. I And then in the point in the movie, he's supposed to have learned. He's had this epiphany. He's going to become a better person fuck no he doesn't even tell them hey i like your song let's play it let's go play the song that we never rehearsed on stage and then i'm gonna run off again if this is him showing how he is in the band i think this was him in real life and he didn't understand that the way he was was wrong this is prince taking a look at himself imagine an artist that is that self-aware who resists the urge to sanitize his darker decisions it's pretty fucking cool like they're like you can make a movie about yourself and he's not like i'm great i never made mistakes whatever he's like yeah i'm a fucking prick i'm egotistical i treat my bandmates this way and i'm going to be true to that and show that on screen that takes some serious balls and big d as you said yeah this movie is deeply autobiographical like you talk about lisa and wendy in the band they were actually in the revolution and they didn't write purple rain but they did leave the band in 1987. Why? Because they wanted to do their own thing. So, I mean, you read between the lines. This is true life. He's not sanitizing anything. Well, and shout out to Lisa and Wendy because they had to hide it at the time of filming Purple Rain, but they were together and they wound up dating for 20 years and talk about some stylish ladies and loved everything those women were wearing in this movie. So Lisa and Wendy, I think they're always giving it their all. They're always there for the band. But I don't know that opening up with Purple Rain on this important performance for them to keep their slot, 
You know, Prince hasn't even told him he's going to play it. And they're coming out on stage after Morris killed it. The band and the whole, like the crowd doing the bird or whatever that other thing was, they were fired up. And then you come out and you play a ballad that the, nobody's heard. I went to Lollapalooza one year. It was early on. Green Day was like the opening act. And the final two acts, it was uh, the Beastie Boys. They came out and did an, a, an encore of Sabotage. So the crowd at Roosevelt Island was going nuts. The stage goes dark for three or four minutes. They switch over to Smashing Pumpkins. They come out and play Disarmed, which is like, show me with your knife. <laughs> Disarm me with your smile. This crowd that had been partying all day, drunk high, who had just been raging to the Beastie Boys, was like, what the hell is this? They turned around and half of them walked out. This song, I don't think a crowd that fired up would have gotten into it when they didn't even know what it was. So first and foremost, fuck anybody who walked out to Disarm, mm -hmm. because Disarm is one of the Pumpkins' best songs. If you fucking heard it in, like, peak Billy Corgan years, like, you're fucking blessed to be in the presence of that. So fuck them. And second of all, what the fuck? Purple Rain is not a ballad. It's not just some ballad. He's not up there singing about some girly loves, and then he wants to make love to at night in the hay. It isn't about that. It's a fucking iconic song. It is the song. If I was at a venue, and the resident artist of that venue came out, a local artist, I'm in Minneapolis, and this guy comes out and debuts Purple Rain. No one's ever heard this song before. I would have fucking sold my soul for their t-shirt. Also, I should point out that Lollapalooza is no litmus test for good music because Devo came out in Lollapalooza and got booed off stage and Metallica had to come back out and fucking yell at the crowd and tell them they're a bunch of fucking assholes because they didn't understand what, what a gift Devo is. But think about, I want you to think about the first time you heard Purple Rain. That's why I bought right? the tape. Like, and what it made you feel, because there's no song, I don't think, more connected, obviously, with this movie, and I would argue even Prince himself, than Purple Rain, because it's one of those songs that's quintessentially Prince. Like, no one else could ever cover this song or do this song the justice that he does, and... It's a song that's perfect. It's always been perfect. It's always gonna be perfect. And I know that fans for years have been trying to figure out what it means. And Prince at this point in his life in the 80s was really obsessed with the apocalypse. And so he's talked about how purple rain signifies the end of the world because the blue sky with the red blood falling from the sky meshed together to make purple. And I think all of that is just beautiful and this performance here is so earnest it's so real i know it's like 10 minutes long but it doesn't feel self-indulgent it feels like every chord every you know when, oh my god when he hits those high notes at the end where he's just singing like it's all so necessary and i am not a big football fan i mean go saints woo but you know i watched the super bowl because I have to, because I'm at parties. But I remember when he played the halftime show and the chord struck up a Purple Rain. Everybody knew he was going to close with it. He was on stage by himself. That giant purple cloth thing flew up behind him. And right when his guitar solo began, it fucking started raining. Because if there is a God... Even God bows down to Prince, and it was beautiful, and I cried at a Super Bowl halftime show. And I have nothing else other than to say that Prince in this moment, I don't care if you don't like anything else in this movie. This movie is worth watching because it gave us this song, and it gave us this performance, and he was a fucking God. There's just no other words to say. It poured the entire game. This was Miami. It was the Colts against the Bears. It rained the entire day. Prior to the performance, the director of the halftime show, I saw an interview with him. He called Prince in his hotel room. He was like, Prince, you know, I don't know what to do. We can't stop the rain. There's no cover. We have electricity. He had the two dancers out there with him. He was expecting Prince to say, I can't do it. We got to do some other way. Prince goes, he goes, Prince, is there anything we can do? He goes, can you make it rain more? And he goes, okay. And Prince was like, fuck yeah. Prince took this opportunity. He was going to own it. And you're right. That rain is pouring down. But if you want to see another iconic Prince performance that shifted my view of him, I always thought he was just out there singing. He didn't really play the guitar that well. In 2004, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, they were inducting George Harrison after his death. They put together this all-star band performance of While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Prince has a three-minute solo 
at the end of it, it is it is a milestone performance. These other musicians, these other geniuses, these other Hall of Famers just step back. It's like Michael Jordan on the court and the other players that are great just back the fuck up. At the end of the, the, the thing, he's got the solo. He takes his guitar, throws it directly up into the air, and it vanishes. You don't see it come down anywhere. I don't know how he did it. From that moment on, I realized that Prince, Prince the artist, was a genius. Mm -hmm. And on the guitar, man, he does not get the respect he deserves. Well, the kid returns to the club with his fellow musicians greeting him with approval and a teary-eyed Apollonia embracing him. He returns to the stage for two encores with the revolution to the wild approval of the crowd, even Morris Day. Overlaid scenes show the kid visiting his father and mother in the hospital and sorting his father's compositions in the basement, accompanied by Apollonia. A montage of all the songs plays as the credits roll. So I know that everybody talks about what a great dancer and performer Michael Jackson was, and he was. He was an incredible performer. But I think people forget that Prince can dance. He can not just sing. Like, the dude could dance, and he hits those high notes. And I personally believe he's one of, if not the best guitarist since Jimi Hendrix. I mean, he's absolutely incredible with a guitar. And I don't know about y'all, but I'm there's certain artists that I'm just devastated that I never got to see in person. And I thought I had a little bit more time. And then they left us way too soon. And I like how the end of this movie, it leaves us with this little taste of what it was like. It gives us a chance to see him. It makes you feel like maybe you did see him because he breaks the fourth wall twice and looks directly at the camera. And so it's just kind of perfect. It it feels like, okay, I didn't get to see him in person, but this is the next best thing. And I really want his pants at the end. They were beautiful. And so I hope that someone will find them for me. But I love the end of this movie. Far be it from me to criticize anything Prince put together. But uh, I thought this movie would be over after they performed Purple Rain. Like you could have froze it right there and been done. But no, he runs out to the alley. He comes back. I'm like, okay, an encore. And he plays I Would Die For You. And we know that his dad said that. So that makes sense too. And it's a great song. I Would Die For You. Big Prince hit. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. It's in there. But then he moves on to Baby, I'm a Star. And I think that maybe that last one could have come a little bit earlier in the movie and broken up some of the sections without musical performances. Because this is, after all, a two-hour long movie. And mind you, it does not feel like two hours. Like this movie goes by pretty quickly it is entertaining from start to finish but if i have one criticism there it's that like it would have been more emotional a gut punch if you would have ended with i would die for you which is i would say in the top five print songs of all time but whether or not this movie succeeds as a cinematic masterpiece i think you have to ask yourself a question which is can a single movie summarize an artist completely for someone who's never known him and purple rain does that like if I had a person who had never seen or heard Prince and I wanted them to understand why I love Prince, why his music's important, why he is unique and an original and what his comedy and his romance and his action, Big D, and his passion was all about and his music, I would say just watch Purple Rain and in two hours you can understand exactly everything there is to know about Prince. And this is better than any monument you can build to somebody, better than any documentary about his life. This is... Prince, Eternal, and I love it. His Horcrux. Well, now is the time where we give our wipe scores for Purple Rain. Zero Wipes is a perfect movie. It is cleansing yourself in the waters of Lake Minnetonka. Five Wipes is an absolute disaster. It is Jerome tossing your ass into the dumpster because you crazy. Ash, we'll start with you. What is your wipe score for Purple Rain? So this movie's weird. It has some strange transitions. Um, in some parts, it's a little bit overacted, but... And I know that the plot, to some degree, I think, Gene, you you put a, a a real interesting spin on it, that it just has trouble with the passage of time. And because of that, the plot can feel a little thin. But it's a great concert film. It's a great film. And it's a film that just makes this iconic genius in Prince. It makes us all remember that. And, you know, what I think is so interesting about it is this is in the 80s, and he would have a lot of career left after this. And it felt as relevant in 2021 about who Prince continued to be as it did, I'm sure, back in the 80s. And that's the marker, I think, of a real musical genius. But is it a zero white film? No. Is it a bit self-indulgent in parts, not the songs, but the plot in the movie itself? Maybe. 
But it's a time capsule of this weird time of the 80s. It oozes with fashion, oozes with sex appeal, amazing performances, energy from this little guy who just stole every moment when he was on a stage. And because of that, I think that it is a way better than average movie. And I'm going to say it's 1.75 wipes. This is one of those cases where discussing the movie with you two has changed my opinion. Yeah. I started out pretty harsh. I started out 3.4. I thought it was really... The second half of the movie was dragging for me. So I did go back to defend myself and pulled a screenshot of dad being on the ground. And I'll show you later why I was confused. It's because he has the bandage on his arm with the tank top. It looked like his his stomach was wrapped. Okay, I was wrong there. Maybe I missed some other things is what I'm trying to say. Okay, but (laughs) all of the Prince performance stuff is dynamite. His performances, when you pay to see somebody in a concert, you want to see the whole package. He dances, he moves, he's nonstop energy. I don't know that there's anybody really like him today out there. There's some artists that are entertaining. Prince the Artist is a 0.5 wipe artist. He is almost perfect. I think the movie itself was flawed. I would have rather watched a documentary about Prince and the Revolution, an all-concert film. I would have loved that. Uh, So I'm going to knock it down from a 3.4 to a 2.6 it is slightly worse than average but (laughs) as a historical documentation of prince where he came from and who he was i think it was average big d i will give you this is that they spent more time on close-ups of prince's mouth than they did kind of highlighting one of the biggest turns in the movie was his dad shooting himself in the head like you could have spent (laughs) maybe 90 seconds on that right It, it was like 15 seconds yeah it was like boom he's on the ground and then they actually spent more time looking at the chalk outline, which I don't know why they even drew the chalk <laughs> with outline. With the gun but, in his hand. With the yeah, gun. He's not dead. <laughs> it's weird. But listen, that's what I wanted to get to in my score, which is there isn't a single mistake made in this movie that doesn't make it better. Like every mistake that they made makes it more charming in a fucking weird way. I don't know why. It's like, why? There's, there's a lot of Prince's mouth in this. Cool. You can roll your eyes. You can scream at the screen. You can look at all your friends in the room in disbelief, but not a second goes by in this movie that doesn't engender some reaction from the viewer. How many movies have we watched and reviewed where you're just passive? You're a passenger in the movie. You're just watching it. No, no, no. From start to finish, Purple Rain is action. You are interacting with this movie. It's pure entertainment with bananas good performances musically. And yeah, it's not the most competent filmmaking I've ever seen. And it could stand to be slightly shorter, maybe less focus on the kid's family, but still getting that point across. But I wouldn't change anything about it. Like if you gave me the opportunity to edit this movie, I would leave it exactly as is because it's perfect the way it's supposed to be. It's flawed, but every flaw is fun. So to me, it is a one and a half white movie. So Gene, if we add up your score of a 1.5, my 2.6 2.6 and Ashley's 1.75. That gives us a score of 1.95 wipes. And with that score, that now puts Purple Rain all alone in the 89 spot. It is slightly better than Detroit Rock City and slightly worse than Tombstone. Yeah. I'm okay with, I'm that. with that. Well, thank you, Jared, for giving us a reason to go back and uh, watch Purple Rain and dedicating this to Prince's life and his legacy. Uh, Ash, I believe we have a, an email this week from our Discord friend and dedicated Shappy Hour viewer, Nick Cobbs. When Nick writes, dudes and Ash, but not you, Raj. Just finished the full Monty pod this week and a good episode all around. Another great episode and a room full of great episodes recently. Wanted to fire off a quick email because I've had a few drinks and I got a little emotional listening to Big D and all of you talking about the end of COVID and sort of taking stock of my last year via lockdown. Hope you know by now I'm a chef, dad, restaurateur, etc. What I don't let a lot of people in on is that leading up to COVID, it was basically a hot mess. From the outside, I've got the smoke and hot wife, kids, business, but inside, a flaming hot pile of dung and drunken mess waiting to blow. Turns out, I've been dealing or not dealing with a lot of undiagnosed depression since my 20s. And turns out, like a ton of people of our generation, I had two parents who also dealt with it all their lives and never really bothered to talk about it with our kids until approximately now-ish. 
COVID has been fucked. I mean, like way fucked for everyone. I consider myself lucky that I have only lost one person to the Rona during the last year and that I live in a place, San Francisco, that has taken it seriously from the beginning and continues to as I write. But on a personal level, I've been even more lucky. I am not a happy or optimistic person. Let me repeat, I'm not generally cheery or sunshine, which is amazing on the one hand that there are so many people that want to unsuccessfully be buddies. But on the other, it's kind of irritating. Even when there is a silver lining slapping me in the face, I generally don't get it. But COVID kind of forced me to reevaluate. The restaurants were shut down. Fuck you. We'll do only to go and sell wine and beers and cups. No outdoor dining. Fuck you. We'll shove it in a box and pray to Buddha it stays warm until you drive your Tesla home. I digress. Point is, I, like Big D, have been on some weird level as a much more balanced person during COVID. I was literally working 13 to 15 hours six days a week before and barely making ends meet. I've since got to see my two beautiful and strong-willed young women grow slowly, and yet somehow so fast before my eyes, while trying to take a few mental pictures along the way. We learn how to bike without training wheels, and all the way to the beach. We struggle through learning to read, sight words, marital issues, countless work failures, etc. But at the end of the day, I got to cook more meals and have more end-of-the-night drinks with my wife and kids than I ever would have thought without the Rona. So I got what Big D was saying. It's been a hard year for us, but in a strange way, I needed it. And if you know me, I will value this time much more in five years than I do now. Sorry for the cheesy email, but when I think back, you people were also a reason. I got through it as well. Those first few shappy hours and joining Discord were a saving grace for me mentally. And although I can't join as much as I would like, you're all family now, so you'll understand. Best, Nixie. P.S. Bring on the stress and crazy again because we open our second restaurant in a month. You know, Big D, when you mentioned that the coronavirus was kind of a blessing for you, I think that it was a really odd thing to say. But at the same time, people find like truth in that, right? Like it's it, it has been weird because it caused everybody. I don't care who you are to reevaluate like everything you're doing with your life. I mean, it certainly did me for sure. I mean, I, I like Nick C. I'm not an overtly cheery, optimistic, happy go lucky person. But I, I will admit, I mean, it was very nice to get to be home with my kids. And it was very nice to get to, I don't know, have a clean house because I can actually clean every day. Like, you know, little things like that were, were pretty special. And I think just recently, it's hit me how much was different in that year, because like I was telling you guys, we're vaccinated. And so we took our kids to the movie for the first time. And my daughter, when coronavirus started, she wasn't even one and a half yet. You know, she was still a baby, basically. And so she's never been to a movie theater. And there's this whole world out there that she has never seen and never experienced. But she's more happy and well-adjusted than my son was at this age. And so I think there's something to the way that our life changed because she's this amazing human because she had all this time with us and got to know us and we got to know her in a way that was a gift. And I'm really grateful for that. So Nick, thank you very much for the email. I I do appreciate it. I'm going to try to make an honest effort. You said, you know, you're going to appreciate this more in five years. Don't let this go and have not changed us. Try to make an effort. Now we have, when else in your life do you have, okay, we're going to put the world on pause. That shit don't happen. This has been a year-long snow day. Now, granted, there's been tons of misery and death and people struggling, but you had a chance to stop and just reassess everything. Once we go back to normal and everybody's running around at 5,000 miles an hour and we're thinking back wistfully at this, Take some lessons from it. It shouldn't have taken this shit for me to really appreciate my family. It shouldn't take this to make you not work 16 hours a day. So I'll get off my soapbox, but I appreciate you sharing those intimate moments with us. And we are glad to have you as a friend and a friend of the pod. Yeah, thanks, Nick, so much for writing in. Thank you, Jared, for commissioning uh, the special edition of Shat the Movies. That does conclude this bonus episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shat the Movies. You can email us 
host at shatthemovies.com or call us at 914-719-SHAT. Tell us everything you love about Prince. Tell us what you thought of this uh, review. You can support the podcast by shopping our Amazon affiliate link, completing a free anonymous survey to help attract advertisers, buying our merch, or commissioning your own movie. Find all the information by visiting our website, shatthemovies.com. Also, you can check out our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we review TV series such as Lovecraft Country, Westworld, True Detective, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, and Watchmen. Find all that information on our website, shatontv.com. Wherever a fine podcast can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe, and if you stop by iTunes, please leave a five-star review. That helps the podcast grow. On behalf of my co-hosts, Big D, Dick Ebert, and Ash Schlafly, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us on Tuesdays regularly for Shat the Movies. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you soon.